Thank you for taking the time to listen to our weekly service. This is a listener-supported ministry, and we ask that you pray and see what God would have you give. Now let's get to our sermon for today. Father, thank you for this day and for your goodness to us. And thank you for the the weather getting a lot nicer. And I pray that you'll just continue to bless. And and we just pray for uh, Mouse's uh, family and all that. uh, Just continue to comfort and help them. And also with the the, uh, Joneses right now, with that going down. And, you know, this reminds me of one other person, Doc Hay. Uh, You know he hasn't been doing well, and he's got almost no uh, energy, sleeps a lot, and all, Father. And I pray that you would help him. Uh, He said he wanted to accomplish two things, and I pray you would bless him with. He wants to be at our banquet. And then this year is the 50th anniversary of the Wilds, and he wants to make that special occasion too. I pray, Father, help him. He's he's always had a good heart, and he still does, uh, where he wants to serve you. And, Father, I pray that you would just bless his life in a special way. Bless this morning, Father. Help us as we look to your word and look to Ruth and her life and what she accomplished and did and what you did for her. It's just utterly amazing. I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. What I want to show you today is how God wants to help us. And I try to show you that a lot in a lot of sermons but how God cares for us and how far, literally, he will go to try to help us. And I want us to look at Ruth today, who, who she is and what she do, did. First of all, I want there's three basic characters in this story. Number one is Boaz, the second is Naomi, and the third is Ruth. Uh, Naomi is married and has two sons, and they lived in Bethlehem. And they were having, let's say, kind of a drought, not severe, but just enough to where they needed to move. So they moved to the east side of the Jordan into a land called Moab. And uh, there, uh, their two sons met uh, wives or, uh, you know, women from that country and ended up marrying them. And then a little while later, uh, oh, by the way, the two uh, girls that they married, uh, one was Ruth and the other was uh, Orpha. Then uh, her, no, Naomi's husband ends up dying. And after she die, uh, he died, then they spend about 10 more years in that country when both of her sons, not at the same time, it just mentions that they both ended up dead. So now it's just her and her two da- daughter-in-laws. So Naomi decides she wants to go back to home to Bethlehem. And she talks to her daughters because that, that was their home there. Uh, they didn't live far from mom and dad. She said, maybe it'd be better for you to go back to your mom and dad, start life again. You're young enough. You might find another husband, whatever. She says, I'm too old. I just want to go back home to Bethlehem. Well, uh, Orpha ends up going back. But Ni- uh, Ruth ends up telling her that she wants to go wherever Naomi's going. She wants to be a part of Naomi's uh, 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 people and her God. So she ends up talking her into it and they end up going back. And this is where we pick up with our verse right now in Ruth chapter 2 verse 4 is we pick up after they make it back to Bethlehem. And it says, Behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. Then said Boaz unto a servant that was set over the reapers, Whose damsel is this? And the servants uh, that was set over the reapers answered and said, It is a Moabite uh, damsel that came back from with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And she said, I pray you, let me gleam and gather all the reap, uh, <coughs> excuse me, after all the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and has continued even from the morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to gleam in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Let let thy eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. 
Have I not charged the young men that they should not touch thee? And when thou art thirst, go unto the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. Then she fell down on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thy eyes, that thou should take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? And Boaz answered and said unto her, It has been fully shown me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thy husband and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity, and art come unto a people which thou knowest not heretofore. The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel under those wings thou art come to trust. Then she said, Let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for thou hast comforted me, and for that thou hast spoken friendly unto thy handmaiden, though I be not like unto one of thy handmaidens. And Boaz said unto her, At mealtime come thou hither, and eat of the bread, and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers, and she reached in her pouch of corn, and she did eat, and was sufficed, and left. And when... Uh, and when she was risen up to gleam, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her gleam even among the sheaves, and reproach her not. Let, and let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her, and leave them, that she may gleam them and rebuke her not. It's an interesting story here. And this isn't the whole story, but this is the section we're looking at today. Boaz is a very wealthy man uh, from Bethlehem. He owns a lot of land that he grows crops at. Now, Boaz is a kingsman. Now, a kingsman is, uh, and the word kingsman literally means to redeem. A kinsman in the Jewish thing would be if something went wrong with another relative, they would come in and help him, whatever that might need might be. And it would always uh, occur to the nearest relative of that person. And if they didn't like it they uh, or couldn't do it, then it would be to the next nearest and keep going down. And someone would take care of that. Now, Ruth doesn't know any of this at this time. But uh, Boaz was the kinsman of Malon, which was the husband of Naomi. And uh, so it falls nearest to, to the relationship, as I just mentioned. And Boaz was not the nearest. There was one, <coughs> one nearer. And later on, what happens was when he decides he wants to redo the redeeming, he goes to that one that's in line and asks him, will you redeem and help Ruth? And he says, no, I can't do that right now because I'm doing this, this, and this. He says, okay. So then Boaz became the redeemer. And I'll explain explain a little bit more as uh, the story goes on. So Boaz shows up in his field where they're harvesting. Boaz greets his workers in the name of the Lord. And this and some of the other things mentioned here, you realize Boaz is really a man of God. And even the way he greets his uh, workers, you realize they have a great relationship with each other in, with God. And uh, so it was really pretty nice. So anyhow, uh, this and some other things do you see in Scripture that you can see what type of relationship they did have. Now, Naomi tells Ruth to go to Boaz's field to gleam. Now, Naomi knows what's going on because she's Jewish, and she knows that Boaz is part in the family of, of redemption and re, uh, redeeming. So she said, go to him, because she, she knew but she didn't tell Ruth anything. She just said, just go to that field. You go there. She was just hoping that God would work. And this was God's way, by the way. Uh, now, to glean literally is when you go through a field and you have all these workers doing it. And the next thing you know, something got left behind, missed. And when God's rule and the law in the Old Testament was you did that and left that, whatever it was there. Don't go back and clean it up again. Leave it there for the poor people. And it was God's way of taking care of poor people. Now, just as a small rabbit trail, 
All through Scripture, God talks about taking care of poor people. He always says that there's always going to be poor people. We cannot stop and eliminate poor people. It just ain't going to never happen. And uh, and, uh, what's interesting is I was convicted many years ago that I wanted to take care of people in need. And uh, but I had a problem, and that was I don't want to give it to somebody who's going to go out and get drugs and build booze and, and all that. I want to take care of somebody who really has a need, and it's hard to figure out sometimes, especially the people walking in the streets and all, or have the signs up there. You know, I will work for food, and it, okay, come on and work. No, I don't want to work. They're up there, and people would just give them money. And by the way, I do know of one. Now I, I don't know him personally that when they were done, walked back and literally got in a Mercedes and rode away. But they had it like a half a block away. I, that happened many, many years ago. I happened to see that. But what's interesting is I had such a burden, and I wasn't sure what's the best way to go about it. And Al Carper, which some of you already know, I discussed it with him one day, and he brought up the fact of what took place here. Uh, he says, Glenn, if you think about it, God took care of the old people, but he did one thing. He made them do. Guess what he did? He made them work for the food that they were getting. They had to go to the field to glean the field. So it wasn't handed out like we do today and give a person a check to government and says, here, go do what you want. And then they end up driving a Cadillac and on and live in a home that, you know, nobody wants to live in. And, and I've seen that up in Baltimore all the time. And, uh, and, uh, And unfortunately, people take advantage of stuff like that. So, I don't know, maybe some of you may or may not have remembered this, but I think that it was in South America. There was a town there or something, a governor. I don't Mm -hmm. remember names or anything else, but I remember what he did. And it became real big news in the United States when this happened. He had a town, just like Jamaica and some of these other ones, with this terrible slum area. And, uh, and he was trying to figure out how could he make his town great. And what he ended up doing was he had all the poor people bring trash to a recycling place or a place. And they paid them to bring the trash. And they cleaned up the city and got the poor people working and making money. And became such big news in the United States that look what this guy did using the old poor people and helping them out. Uh, didn't do any good for the United States, though, but <laughs> they didn't get the lesson from that. But again, I thought it was a neat way of help accomplishing something, using the poor people and taking care of them at the same time. And that's what God's doing right here. So Ruth is not is not uh, very, she don't ha- actually have any money, and she's pretty poor. And and so is Naomi. Uh, uh, she don't have anything. Now, she's in a strange land. But God is about to change all that into a good way. Ruth has totally committed her life to God. And God is about to work in her life and change her life forever. And we're going to look at that. And what was coming about was God was working with Boaz to meet her every need. As we read some of it already. Boaz spots Ruth in the field. Something about Ruth attracted him. Now, we do know what something we just read that, number one, she worked really hard while she was in that field. She was taking care of her mother-in-law. We know that. Now, Bethlehem was a very, very small town, so everybody knew everybody. So if something happened, everybody knew about it. And that's what happens. Uh, uh, Boaz goes to Foreman and says, uh, who is this? Oh, she's a Moabite. You know, uh, return with Naomi. Also, she requested permission to glean the field, which I think would showed her character. She also worked very diligently all morning long, it says. Boaz demonstrated unusual care for Ruth. His concern for her is a beautiful type of, of how the Lord takes care of us. The whole story is a picture of God and how he redeemed us that were unsaved, And we were strangers in a land as far as the Lord's concerned and became a child of the king when we came to know Christ as our Savior. And this indicates that she is now part of the covenant because he says to her, my daughter. And it's an interesting statement to come. Now, the Jews didn't like anybody going outside and getting married. And yet Ruth now is a stranger. She's not a Jewish. 
She's, that's why she used the word stranger. And yet it shows that God blessed her and brought her into the family when she was um, ready to commit her life to God, as it says in the scripture. She sought to help. He sought to help her by inviting her to gleam only in his fields. Now that's an interesting thing. He said, don't go to any other fields. Just You just stay in mine. I'll take care of you. Boaz also instructed his men not to touch her or bother her in any way that he protected her. And then he went as far as, uh, I don't know if you picked up on it, she could drink the water that the workers picked up and did, where the other ones gleaming had to go get their own water. So he goes a step further and acknowledges her also, her faith in the Lord. He says, I know you've committed your life to God. That's another interesting thing. And then he did the final thing, which is, I don't know if you ever pick up on this, you ever realize the blessings in the Old Testament? Uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. There's a spiritual blessing and then there's a physical blessing. Spiritual blessing was the most important. It became, you know, you were blessed. You'll have, uh, like Abraham was blessed. He was going to have, his family would be the, the, he couldn't number the stars. Uh, each blessing was different. It became such a big deal uh, with the two brothers, uh, Isaac, yeah, I forget who it was now. Isaac and Joseph, was it? Joseph. Okay, when stole his blessings and I had to run away, which we talked about last week a little bit. It was a big deal. And here, Boaz ends up blessing Ruth. So Ruth is surprised about all this. She is shocked to the point that she, she literally can't believe the promises and the protections being provided by her. And she falls down on her knees before him humbly and asks, how could you... Give me this favor of being a stranger. She knows what her place. She knows she's not a Jew. How could you be doing this to me? Do you, don't you see what's happening here? This is exactly what happens when a person accepts Christ as their Savior and God starts taking care of them and putting them in the family. If we are totally committed to God, and that's the secret word here, guys, that's the thing that opens your whole life to your blessings from God is being committed to him. Doesn't mean you become a monk or a preacher or anything like that. What it means is you commit your life to God. I always tell people, if you want a great marriage, don't try to be the best you can for your wife. Be the best you can for God and you'll be the best you can for your wife. Same thing with the wives to the husband and with the family. God's got to be number one in your life. And if that happens, everything else will fall, fall through. And that's what happens here. And he ends up taking care of Ruth in a special way. Look what happens next as Boaz responds to Ruth. He tells her that he has heard about her abandonment of her former life. She abandoned her former life. Also of her total commitment as she made to Naomi and to God and to their people. Keep in mind again that Bethlehem was a small city and everybody knew this and all, and that's how he found out about it. So Ruth responds to this unusual favor of Boaz. She acknowledges his goodness and his and her unworthiness. And she requests uh, his continued favor as she gleams in the field in order to feed Naomi and herself. But listen to what a commentator says. I'm gonna, this is a quote. It says, notice how abundantly Boaz provides for Ruth. When lunchtime came, he invited her to share the noon meal with himself and his reapers. Interestingly, he himself serves her. Now think about this. This is a guy very high up serving the lowest of the low. Very interesting. Uh, then he gave her special, uh, special orders to his workers regarding her, and they were to let her gather among the sheaves and not to rebuke or stop her in any way. Even ordered the workers to purposely drop stacks for her to pick up. In other words, just accidentally, don't let her know you're doing it. And make sure she gets some of the good stuff. I guess to say it's corn and all, because it did mention corn there at one time. So Boaz spots Ruth working in the fields so the same way the Lord looks in our lives. 
and sees us and sees we need a, a, a need for a savior. And Jesus Christ comes into the world so we can have a way. Christ is our redeemer. Just the way Boaz was the redeemer for Ruth. And then, and then he ends up helping her. And listen how he helps her now. Think about this. So the Lord has always taken the initiative in seeking help for us. He takes the initiative. How does he do that? Well, in other words, the Holy Spirit has to convict us in order for us to get saved. Well, then after we're saved, what happens? The Holy Spirit speaks to you when you're in here learning. I'm not making this stuff up. That's why I give you the scripture. So you can go back and read it when you go home. But if you do what God asks you to do, God will bless your lives. And you can be, get to the point, you, you haven't heard the, the uh, how would you say, the icing and the cherry on top of the Sunday I'm about to give you at the end here. That how God took care of Ruth in such a special way. Why? Because she was not just committed, but she was totally committed. And because of that, ends up getting so much more than what she deserved. And then I realized, and I've said this time after time, when I realized the Apostle Paul felt that he wasn't worthy of anything that God's given him, and he felt he was the worst of all sinners. And I felt the same way. And I think every one of us get to that point in our lives when we get close to the Lord, closer and closer, and you realize you don't deserve nothing, and yet God keeps blessing and taking care of us. And the more totally we're committed to him, the way Ruth was, the better God responds to us. Now, just as Boaz promised to protect and provide for Ruth, so the Lord protected and provided for us. Boaz provided abundantly for Ruth, and so the Lord wants to take care of his people too. Go back in the Old Testament. You see it over and over again. God's always forgiving and helping. Always forgiving and helping. But the moment we do wrong, he brings stuff into our lives. He, I mean, he only waits so long. But we must be totally committed. And that means learn what God teaches you and apply it right away. Don't go out and say, I'm going to pray about it for a week. I'll think about it. We're to literally, whatever you learned, whatever your need was today that you've learned something, you need to apply it right away today and just keep using it and trust God. Claim the promises in the word of God. Watch God work in your lives. And through that, number one, your, your commitment gets more. Number one, your faith gets stronger. You start seeing God work more and more in your life. Just as Boaz encouraged Ruth when she was in the deepest need, so the Lord will encourage us in our deepest moments. Sometimes he doesn't respond right away. Sometimes he doesn't give us everything we pray for right away. And God tests us a lot. And he speaks about that in some of the lessons we've had in the past. God wants to say, do you really have the faith or are you just saying you have it? Well, I'm going to test you. <laughs> Sometimes we wait so long, it seems like it's past that point when we really needed it. But as long as God knows the future, he knows how far we can go. And he says, no temptation is taking you to such as common to man, that he will not tempt you above what you're capable of. God knows your capability. He knows how far he can push it. We sometimes don't, or we give in too quick. And you know what's really neat? The best part of this whole story is Boaz ends up redeeming Ruth. They fall in love, and they get married, and she has a son from him. And that's not the very top. That's The cherry is, is this. I didn't realize this until I was doing some more reading. They become the great-grandparents of King David. Which also means that they're in the linear of Jesus Christ. A stranger that wasn't a Jew got all that because she totally committed her life to God. Something to think about. Something to go home and really think about. That God is there and he's got promises all through the scripture. I was just reading today, uh, you know, I always encourage you to read Proverbs. Well, Proverbs chapter 3 today talks about if we acknowledge him, he says he will take our life. I did it, I actually did a little research on it. The, I didn't put the, bring the verse in here to quote it, but basically it says that if you 
uh, trust in God that he will take care of you. It's, it, I think in some scriptures it says that it will extend your life. But what it really means is the life you're going to live to the day you die will be a life you'll enjoy living. Read Proverbs chapter 3 today. It's really interesting. If you happen to have the Amplified Version, it brings it out much stronger. But it's still, regardless of what uh, version you use, it, it's really neat. God, this is the whole story. God has put this in the Bible for us to learn. That's why it's there. And so many other stories that we'll look at in the future. And uh, right now I'm working on something that I've been working on for a long time, law versus grace. To help everybody understand that more between the Old and the New Testament. I'm not sure when I'm ready yet for that. Uh, let's see. The week, the following week, not this Saturday. This Saturday is the run. So the following Saturday, I'll be out. I'll be actually coming back on Sunday. Uh, Gary will be speaking uh, that Sunday. Mom. Huh? Yeah, I'll be at my mom's coming back. That's a short trip. I'm going to leave Thursday and come back on Sunday. I had to do that because of Daytona. Betty didn't want me to be away two weeks, two full weeks in such a short period of time. And so you're and, leaving this Thursday? No. No, no, next week. <laughs> next week. And you know, uh, so my mom keeps calling me. When are you coming? When are you coming? She's excited. <laughs> Uh, I hope you understand what I try to do. My biggest goal always is that you can experience the blessings that God wants to give to you as a Christian. And then if you're not saved, that you get saved and come to know Christ as your Savior the way the Bible is. I meant to bring something today and I forgot to bring it. A guy in Maryland supports our ministry occasionally. A guy that lives in Maryland. He's actually been in the service here. His name's David, and uh, and when he's in town, he, he'll come by and spend time in town, but he lives in Maryland. And uh, and he gave me a little track that uh, that was pretty cool, because it, it's actually a uh, calendar on one side, and then just a quick thing. But the biggest thing where most people go wrong on salvation is they don't understand repentance. Repentance must take place to be saved. You can say, I believe in Jesus Christ all day long, does not get you to heaven. You can believe he died on the cross for you, does not get you to heaven. Repentance along with that is what gets a person to heaven and all. And uh, scripture is pretty clear about that. That's why I'm afraid that uh, a lot of preachers have said that when we get to heaven or after the rapture of the church, that we're going to surpri be surprised how little people will be in the rapture. And, and I don't mean a few. Obviously, there's going to be many hundreds of thousands or whatever, I mean, through all this life that's existed since the beginning. But it's not going to be as heavy as you think it is. You're going to see people down here that, well, I thought he was saved, and he wasn't. See, we don't know people's hearts. We can only, how does God tell us how we can know someone can be saved? Anybody? Nobody? <laughs> By how they act, what they do. That's what the scripture says. Paul says that all the time, especially in James. I will know you by your works, how you live your life, what you say, how you say it, all that. That's how we know people are saved. And all. So think about that. But anyhow, think about how God wants to help you. And think about Ruth. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Bless us this day and, and work in our lives that we may carry this message on the rest of this day and really instill it into our hearts. Help us to take advantage of these things that you have for us, that we can be rejoicing always, knowing we know Christ is our Savior and knowing that you're there to take care of us and help us, even though we're during a time of need when we don't feel like nothing's being done. You know everything going on in our lives and help us to, to be aware of that. Bless us this week, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that we have been a blessing to you. For further assistance, call us at 864-270-1472 anytime. 
Send email to info at stlmm.org or visit our website at www.stlmm.org. Like any ministry, it costs money to operate. Please consider supporting this ministry as God leads you with your prayers and your financial gifts by going to www.stlmm.org and clicking on Donations.